Hey folks, Levi here once again. Um, I know I've been gone for a while. I'm sorry guys, last week I did do my ranking of Roger Moore's Bond films. I know I'm starting off soon, but anyway, I just had some things I had to do. But uh, I want to welcome you guys to another Bond review. And uh, yeah, like I said, um, I did some things I had to do last week. Uh, right now it's kind of snowing. Well, not snowing, but it's kind of snow is falling. It's, so it might be snowing, so I don't know. But, anyway, you know, uh, th but this, this is another Bond review. This is my review of the 15th James Bond movie in the franchise, I believe, and it's the first to star Timothy Dalton as James Bond, and that is The Living Daylights, yes. And this is the 15th Bond film in the series. I don't really need to get the special edition of this one because cause I believe all you see on the back here of the movie you know, some pictures of the movie and stuff. I think back here, right here in this spot, there's like special features and stuff. Deleted scenes with an introduction by director John Glenn. Happy Anniversary 07. Timothy Dalton, the new James Bond. Uh, Timothy Dalton on acting. Dalton and DeBurro in interviews. The Ice Chase outtakes. Deleted footage. I don't know if it has a making of the movie. 07 Mission Control, interactive guide into the world of the living Dallas. Because you see, it, even though I got this off Amazon and the movie still works, as you can see, yeah, Dalton and the Bond girl there, what's her name? Kyra, forget, but then there's Timothy Dalton as Bond. So, yeah, this is the movie, and these are the special features. So, it's a little DVD, but I like this DVD, I like this cover, it's pretty cool. So, anyway, what I I don't want to go into quickly what I think about it, but as you know, two minutes in, okay. As you know, I'm going to talk about how the movie. Well, for this, I'm. Well, I guess because I haven't done this in a while. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> but as you know, what I do with my Bond reviews, I explain how it got made, the cast, who worked on the movie, and the plot, and I give my thoughts and opinion on the film. Uh, I just wanted to say I got 79 subscribers now, so thank you guys out there. I appreciate that. Thank you to my new subs. Uh, welcome to my channel. I hope you enjoy. I hope I get more subs. I think I'm pretty close to 100, and I hope I keep getting more. And thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate that and commenting. Yes, I got some commenting on commenting on my Roger Moore Bond rankings, and I appreciate that, guys. And I hope you keep commenting here on my Bond reviews, giving your thoughts on the Bond movie, on the Bond films and stuff. I really do appreciate that, guys. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so with the Living Daylights, it came out in 1987. This is the same year, I think, Beverly Hills Cop 2 came out, and Robocop. Uh, there's some other movies, but I'm kind of forgetting at the moment. I don't want to look it up, because I don't want to waste any time. But, I think 1987 was a pretty good year for movies. But anyway, with Living Daylights, this was after Roger Moore retired, because the last one was Few Day Kill, and he retired afterwards. And this one, they decided to go in a darker direction, a different direction, because, you know, with the overtop silly humor and stuff with Roger Moore, and I don't blame them. But, I don't, personally, I don't think they need to go in that darker direction. I don't blame them, but you could use still some humor in the movie. I'm not talking about over-the-top silly humor. I'm just mean, like, one-liners. You could still use some humor in the film. But, uh, but it's not a bad movie. I don't love this one. I think it's a decent film. I do think it's a little overrated. I'm sorry. I think License to Kill is better than this one. Dalton... He's better than uh, Roger Moore, but I'm not too big on him as James Bond. I like his, you know, that he shows that he can be a ruthless killer, and that he can be a bastard, you know. But he had no charm or charisma. He just doesn't sleep with women. He doesn't really have any humor to him, you know. I think Bond should have a sense of humor, you know. But, and Dalton, yeah, he's got the, he's good at, you know, being dramatic and stuff, and being a ruthless killer as Bond, but... That is James Bond, but you need some other stuff there, too, which I thought this film was lacking, you know, in the other one. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. In my opinion, they still were kind of missing the boat with this franchise. They really didn't know what they were doing. Not saying the Dark Direction was bad. No, I don't blame them for going that direction, you know. But anyway, I'll get more into that later. Let me talk about how the film got made. And it is the fifth Bond and... Fifth entry... <laughs> 15th Bond film, and it is the first star, Timothy Dalton as Bond. 
The film is taken from Ian Fleming's short story, The Living Daylights. It was the last time to use the title of an Ian Fleming story until the 2006 installment, Casino Royale. So they're going by the book, which I don't really care about them going to the by the book. I would like to read Ian Fleming's James Bond book someday, but you know what? The books should be different from the movie. I'm not talking about over-the-top silly humor. You know, once again, I know I keep repeating myself. But production, okay, so how the film got made. Originally, the film was to pro proposed to be a prequel in the series, an idea that eventually it was supposed to be like, but it ended up being in the reboot in 2006. Smirsh, the fictional Soviet counterintelligence agency that featured in, in uh, Fleming's Casino Royale. Let me put, I hope you guys can hear me. Casino Royale and several other early James Bond novels. Casting, and... In 1985, following the financial and critical disappointment of Fidel Kill, but I still enjoy that movie, War began on scripts for the next Bond film with the intention that Roger Moore would not respire the role of James Bond. Moore, who would, by the time of the release of Living Deaths, be 59 years old, he claims that he chose to retire from the role after 12 years and 7 films. Upper Broccoli, however, claimed that he let Moore go from the room. But I think Roger Moore just quit. Because he knew he couldn't be Bond anymore because of his age. A significant search for a new actor to play Bond. A number of actors, including New Zender Sam Neill, who was Alan Grant in Jurassic Park. Sam Neill actually did a screen test, I believe. You know, uh, Pierce Bronson was going to be in the film. And then, you know, it was between him and Timothy Dalton. Edition for the role, 1986. <clears throat> Bond co-producer Michael G. Wilson, director John Glenn, Dana, and Bert Bar Bar uh, Barbara Broccoli were impressed with Sam Neill, very much wanted to use him. However, Albert Broccoli was not solid, sold on the actor, which I kind of am with Broccoli on this one. Sam Neill maybe could have played James Bond. I, that would have been interesting, but I don't see him really as James Bond, though. To me, he's more of Alan Grant. <laughs> you know. And they actually have the Aston Martin, which I don't know if that is the that was the car that was used in Goldfinger. It's a car right here. But there's only one scene where Bond uses it. Same thing in, you know, Goldfinger, but never mind. The producers eventually offered the role to Bronson after a three-day screen test. But at the time, Bronson was going to play James Bond at this time, but... Sorry, something popped up. But at this time, he was on the TV show called Remington Still. Uh, he was still on a contract with them. It was canceled by the... It was canceled by the NBC network, though. Yeah, it just talks about here that when the TV show canceled, he was going to be Bond. But before the uh, Remington, he was on a TV show called Remington still at the time. Before it was canceled, uh, they shot five episodes, so Bronson did not play Bond. He was close to doing it, but he couldn't because he was on a contract with them on the show. So back then, I think well, any actors on TV shows, they have a contract, and if they try to get out of that contract, you know, like sign a contract, try to get out of it, it'll end up being a lawsuit, so Bronson couldn't play Bond, he had no choice to stay on the show and finish it. Diana Broccoli suggested Timothy Dalton. Albert Broccoli was intentionally reluctant given Dalton's public lack of interest in the role, but his wife's urging to agree to meet the actor, however, Dalton would soon begin filming Brandon Starr and so would be unavailable. Dalton was offered the role once again, which he accepted for a period. The filmmakers had Dalton but he had not signed a contract. A casting director persuaded Robert Bethrust, an English actor who would become known for his roles in Joking Apart, Cold Feet, and Johnny Appy, Appy to audition for Bond. Brothers believed that his... So... So they wanted to... <laughs> don't to play Bond and... You know, by auditioning other actors. The English actress, who was a former model, was cast as... Kyra Millie. And she had also, I don't know, she had 10 editions for the role of Pugliana Ivana in A Few Day Kill. Barbara Broccoli included Abdul in the edition for Plain Curl, which she later passed. Originally, the KGB general set up by Kosko was to be General Gogol. However, Walter Gota was too sick to handle the major role. And by the way, Walter Gogol, who plays General Gogol in these movies, this was his last time. I think he. I think he passed away after this movie, because he was sick. 
and the you know, if and the care of Liam Bushkin was replaced. He appears briefly at the end of the film. Having transferred to the Soviet diplomatic service, this was Gogol's final performance in a James Bond film. Other actors considered to be for the role of James Bond was Mel Gibson, Mark Greenstreet, Lambert Wilson, Antonio Hamilton, Christopher Lambert, Vina Light, and Andrew Clark, but Dalton eventually, I'm sure, damn it, sorry, got the role at this time. Alright, and filming began at Palma Studios at 07 stage. Uh... Stoner House, I can't say it right. This is one of the houses in the movie. I believe that's supposed to be like the KGB place or something to hide uh, the main villain, which I'll get to later. Oh, no, the movie was. Esther Martin was actually from On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And then the music, I believe, was by John Barry. And the title song, Little Dallas, was co-written by with Paul Wichter and the music group, AHA, you know, I can't say their names right, they did the song, which I'll get to later. So, and that's how Living Dallas got made. <laughs> and Dalton, I'm sure, you know, even though they were persuading him, they were casting other actors, but I'm sure Dalton was picked, you know. Anyway, the cast... Timothy Dalton plays James Bond. Maria Adopolo plays Kyra Melvy. Joe Don Baker plays Brad Whitaker. John Rise Davis plays General Leonard Pushkin. John Rise Davis is a good actor. I've seen him in some other stuff. I believe he was in Indiana Jones, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I think he was also in Last Crusade. But anyway, sorry. Art Milkick Mil Mil plays Carmen Shy. Jerome Kirab plays General Gog George Koskov. Adrian, Adrian Wiskin plays Necros. Thomas Whitley plays Sanders, Bond's ally. Ally, sorry. Robert Brown plays M, the head of MI6. Desmond Llewellyn, De uh, Desmond Llewellyn plays Q once again. Jeffrey Keane plays Frederick Gray. Caroline Bliss plays Miss Moneypenny. John Terry plays Felix Leiter. So, Walter Goto plays General Gogo, who just has a cameo at the end of the film. Virginia Hay plays... Rebukovich? Rebe I can't say her name right. Julia T. Wallace plays Roscoe... Roski Mal Malkos. I can't say some of these damn names right. I'm sorry. But the film was once again directed by John Glenn, produced by Albert Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson. The screenplay is by Richard, Richard Mabum and Michael G. Wilson, based on uh, the Ian Fleming book by James... <laughs> based on the James Bond Ian Fleming... On, on the James Bond book of the same name by Ian Fleming. Music is by John Barry. Cinematography is by Alec Mills. It's edited by John Grover, Peter, Dav and Peter Davis. It's distributed by MGM... It was released June 27, 1987. It's 131 minutes long. The budget to make the movie was $40 million. At the box office, it made $191.2 million. So the movie was a hit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, before I, before I get to the plot and everything, and get my thoughts on the film, we get some water. 14 minutes in? Okay, we're doing good. I don't even know if it's still snowing out there. Excuse me. Sorry, I just... Oh, and by the way, I think Spectre just came out on DVD today, I believe. Today's February 9th. Okay, yeah, I think it came out on DVD today. I'm gonna have to wait to get it, though. Because wait for the price to go down a little bit. Says I don't have a whole lot of money right now, so. All 
All right, so the Living Daylights, 1987. Let me get to it. So the movie pretty much starts off with uh, training exercise. The Double O's agents, you know, of, of the British Secret Service, they're having this training ex exercise to see how they do on the field because I'm sure M is testing them because you know when they go to missions they have to stay alive. Uh, one of and then one of the men looks like. Uh, this is a training exercise they do, like, they don't really shoot them. They have these guards in there, but I'm sure they work for British. They work for the secret British Secret Service. When they, like, shoot you with, like, a paintball gun, like, oh, you're dead. Because one of the agents looks like Roger Moore. The other looks like George Lazenby. But this guy breaks in there for some reason. And he actually kills one of the agents. And then we get to see our new Bond, Timothy Dalton. You know, then Bond looks over. He's, he finds the guy that he's like, he tries to go chase the guy, but he's got to hide from him a bit. Uh, Bongo chase the guy, one of the workers, whatever, that works for the British Service, he shoots up, Bongo's like, hey man, you're dead, and Bongo just pushes him out of the way, is able to jump on, jump, jump on the truck, is able to, you know, break in there a bit, the truck gets on fire, him and Bongo get into a bit of a fight, Bond is able to parachute out of there, the guy gets killed, Bond ends up on this lady's boat, she's like, if only I could find a man, and then Bond lands on her boat, and she's like, sure, okay, like this, right, she'll have to call you back, sorry, 007 reporting in, and she's like, would you care to join me? But the train's like, make it two. Mm. And pretty much then you have the song by the ba the music group, you know, ha ha ha, the living daylights. Ha 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 ha, the living daylights. Living is the way we die. Da -da -da, da -da -da. That was an okay song. But anyway, after that, Bond is on a mission. He goes and meets Sanders, this guy who's his ally, and uh, this the the just General Koskov. Forgive me if I can't say his name right. Some of these damn names are hard to say. Is trying to, you know, defect and get out of Russia, I guess. And they had to protect him because they believe somebody's trying to kill him. Or maybe look on Wikipedia. Yeah, but anyway, Bond and Sanders go to this place, uh, this hotel room, they get this sniper gun, and they believe that this lady, that this sniper is a woman trying to kill uh, Costco. Uh, Bond doesn't kill her. He's supposed to kill her, but he doesn't. He just shoots her in the arm. You know, he even admits that, well, I'll get to it later, but uh, they're able to get Gusko out of there. Bond takes him away, and Sanders like, what are you taking him? like, sorry, sorry, old boy. Section B, par paragraph 5. Need to know. <laughs> and Bond is able to get away. They meet this woman there. This, I don't know what, it's like an oil rig, I guess. I don't know what the place is called, but she distracts this guy. They're going to send him over this tunnel so he can get out of Russia or get out of the place. And they send him through this tunnel. I thought it was funny, though. He's like, wait a minute. He's like, oh, thank you, James. Why don't you give some home to Ginger? Like, Bond's like, not now, General. And <laughs> he's freaked out to go in this tunnel. He's like, have you ever tried it before? And he's like, you're the first. They're like, no! You know, he's able to go through the tunnel. You have people kind of hearing it. You have a dog barking at it. Um, he's able to meet up with Q. He gets on the plane and go. Uh, then Bond later on meets with Sanders. And Sanders tells him, your orders were to shoot her, Bond. And he's like, he's like, bloody hell with my orders. And he's like, girl, didn't, girl I only kill professional. That girl didn't know... You know, the rifle from one to another. Oh, the sun's coming up, so never mind. But he doesn't say that, but he's like, I must have scared the living daylights out of her. I think he says that later when he meets General Costco. But... Yeah. But then later, I believe they go to this house that Costco is being protected in. For the MI6 is protecting him. Uh, he he talks to them about the old policy, meaning death to spies, has been reviewed by General Bushkin. That Bushkin is behind it, trying to kill him, I guess. And then later on, Necros, you know, comes. He's this big guy, strong guy with the headphones, and he like kills a couple people. Uh, he hurts these two guys, and I think he's got he's got like these milk cartons. Almost something like that, but a little kind of bigger. And he throws it, and it's like a bomb in it. He's able to kidnap General Gogol, Costco, get him out of there. 
you know, Necro kidnaps him. And then he's taken back to Moscow. And then Bond is ordered to tra track down Bushkin and kill him in order to further killings of agents and tensions between the Soviet Union and the West. Although Bond's prior knowledge of Pushkin intentionally leads him to doubt Kosko's claims. So at this point, Bond is kind of suspicious of Kosko's, you know, he might be up to something. You know, when he finds out the assassin who killed 04, he left a note bearing the same message, Summit Spy, which means uh, the death of spies, which when that guy killed uh, Agent 04, uh, Bond was able to find that out. And I believe he goes to meet. He tracks Kara down, and he's able to follow her. The KGB grapher and Bushkin is part of that. Uh, Bond is able to, you know, he's at her place. She's like, she's like, what are you doing here? He's like, I'm here to help you. That he tells her that he's a uh, friend or something that they've been friends for a long time, and he's here to help her. But um, yeah, he was like, where'd you come from? He's like, KGB headquarters? Well, they're following you. And her, you know, she has to go get her cello. Well, that, well, Cause Bond is able to get this case that she had and he finds the sniper gun she used. Uh, they're able to, you know, the train comes by, they're able to sneak away from the KGB. Cause she's like using a floor booth. This guy's kind of suspicious. He looks over, opens the door, and then it falls down. And she's like, I gotta go back to get my, my cello. He's like, Bond's like, why couldn't you learn the violin? And... I believe after that, uh, they're able to get, you know, they end up in the snowy place, they're trying to, uh, her and Bond end up in the Aston Martin, which is a pretty cool scene, it is decent, you know, uh, Bond, is, one of these KGB guys is trying to stop Bond, Bond's, but he pretty much, well, it doesn't, I mean, he a little small there, Bond's able to, like, use the laser and the tire, I mean, and able to stop them. And then he, like, is able to get two missiles in the car and blow up their blocked, you know, because they're trying to, you know, set up a roadblock and they, Bond is able to blow their truck up. Uh, Bond gets away, they kind of shoot up Bond, shoot up Bond and her for a bit. But they're in the car, they're safe. They get in this farm and they're, but they're able to get out eventually. And the chase happens for a bit. Then Bond blows up the car, he puts it to self-destruct, they grab a cello, they go sli sliding down the snow. It's a pretty fun scene. And I thought that was, you know, and they're able to get out of there eventually. It was an entertaining chasing, I like that. And then Bushkin meets with arms dealer Brad Whitaker. And, yeah, which is played by John Don Baker. He would also later be in GoldenEye and The Morning Never Dies. But as a good guy. But in this film, he plays... Brad Whitaker, who's a guy that's an arms dealer, but he's also obsessed with the war. He's got everything that's based on the army. Yeah, he's got toys and stuff that's, you know, you press the button and do like a war button. But, uh, and then Bushkin knows, tells him that, I know something's between you. You know, I know that you and Cusco are working together, you're up to something. And it stops here now, understand me? And then I believe... Whitaker goes to Costco and Necros, and they're just kind of. Uh, he goes to meet. Well, Whitaker goes to meet uh, uh, Costco's and uh, Necros, and tells them that I can't say the name right. Sorry, and tell them that you know, you know, James Bond needs to kill him. He's getting in our way of what we want to do. You know. Have, you know, they kill one of the other MS6 agents to piss Bond off to go to go after Bushkin and kill him. And Bond meets with his ally. He's kind of, you know, him, he's spending time with Karai a little bit. And he tells him that, he tells his ally that he thinks that Costco is up to something, that this is all a conspiracy, that him and Brad Whitaker, the arms dealer, is up to something. Of, you know, they're planning to do something bad, of course, <laughs> which bad guys do. Uh, her and Bond spend some time together. They go on this Ferris wheel. I don't know, it's kind of a different Ferris wheel. It's like a, I don't know what you call it, like a skyline almost. I don't know what you call it, but Bond is able to stop it, and, you know, they make out for a bit. They don't really have sex in it, but, because people, they're like, people, 
like they see them kind of make out and they're laughing, they would get out of there, Bond goes meets his ally, and tells him thanks, you know, for something, and uh, Necro shows up, because he's got these balloons, he's able to put the bomb in the store, as soon as Sanders walk by, he pushes the button, and it blows up, and it kills Sanders, and Bond gets really pissed, and it says the same thing, which the death by spies, Bond gets pissed, he breaks the balloon on him, and, you know, Bond thinks he sees Necro's walking by, you know, he jumps over this fence, points his gun out, and then there's a mother and a kid in Bunga. Yeah, he wasn't going to shoot a mother and a kid, and then he tells Carrot that they're going to leave, she's like, can we stay? He's like, no, we're going now, because he's just pissed off. Then I believe after that, he goes after... Yeah, because the messages were smirk, spymen. Well, Bond realizes that Costco is aware of his of his investigation. And Bond goes to, they end up going to Tanger. Bond confronts Pushkin. Pushkin. You know, he's able to kind of point a gun at him. Tells him, why are you doing this? Why are you killing these Asians? He's like, it's not me. It's not me, Bond. Because, you know, well, he is able to get this, push this button on his watch. It's got like a tracker in it. Or it's like got a beeping noise that like if he's in, that he's in trouble. Uh, Bond is able to strip down his Pushkin's girlfriend. The guy gets distracted. Bond's able to knock him out. Tells her to go in the bathroom. And Bond's about to kill him. And then him, Bushkin, you know, Bond realizes that he's not it. And so they end up faking his death really good too. Because it makes... They fake his death like Bond, like, shoots him. Negros is about to kill him. But Bond does and they think he's dead. But then you find out, it, you know, they, they... Him and Bond made forces, you know, teamed up. And it was all a trick, you know. Yeah, and, oh, Bushkin also tells Bond that he's invading a rest for embezzlement of government funds. Well, yeah, then Costco contacts Miley, Kara, t t t tells Kara that Bond is a K KBG, uh, KGB agent. She's like, James, where have you been at? Well, I forgot he meets Felix Leiter for a bit, because these two girls says, you want to party? And then they take me to the he's like, oh, nothing personal, Bond. And he's like, oh, it's fine. Is the party still on? Him and Phyllis talk for a bit, but then he goes back to Karen. And he says, there's something wrong. Uh, he drinks, you know, she gives him the drink, shaking that sort of the martini. But she poisons his drink. It doesn't kill him, or it, puts a, it drugs his drink, and it makes him pass out. Necros comes in, Bond's trying to pull his gun out, but he passes out. They take Bond to the airport, or are trying to get out of the country. They're smuggling these diamonds. Uh, with an animal heart out of the country, uh, Bond, you know, Kyra wakes up and apologizes to Bond that she, you know, now believes him, because he does tell her that, before he passes out, he tells her that he was the person that was sent to kill her, but he didn't, and that he's a British Secret Service, you know, that he's a MI6 agent, not KGB. They go to Afghanistan. Uh, Kuskov portrays Miley, and he imprisons her along with Bond. Uh, they meet this dude, this prisoner guy. Uh, this is where they meet Karamah Shah, who's the leader of the local Majan, Majan, you know, like, their Afghanistan resistance or something like that. You got this guy, this jello guy, who's a major asshole, you know, with a stick that he beats people with. I forgot, Bond gets this technology, this gadget that, I don't know, it looks like car keys almost, but it's not. It's like a uh, something you can use, and then when he, you know, whistles, you know, it'll, it'll, st you know, stun gas will come out, and Bond is able to use that, these guys pass out Bond fights with these guys a bit, and then he's able to kick that guy's ass and put him in the, and put him in the jail cell, Bond and her try to escape, but do escape, uh, they come up against the Afghanistan resistance leader guy's men, when they take him back to Bond's place. Uh, so they're in Afghanistan for a bit. That part I was kind—I of, thought was kind of boring. But then Bond tells him that he needs to get back to London. That he's a British Secret Service. And every time Bond's trying to tell him something, they're just—they're <laughs> just laughing every time. I'm like, this is annoying. Cause it didn't, you know, this—I don't know it, what, what was it said that he was so funny. You know, that was so funny. But anyway, they decided to later on help Bond. Uh.
and then Bond and Molly discover that Costco is using Soviet funds to buy a massive shipment of opium from the Montegrand. They tend to keep the profits with enough leftover to supply the Soviets with their arms and buy Western arms from Whitaker, so billions of dollars and stuff, so I guess that's what their plan is. Yeah, Bond plans to bomb aboard the cargo plane carrying the opium, and, but before he can, Costco and Necro spots him, so Bond is able to knock this guy out, get that kid where someone starts shooting and people run. He's going to shoot these other two guys behind him, but they run the heck out of there. Bond turns around, and they're gone. Bond is able to get on the plane. They're trying to, you know, stop Bond. Uh, Kara goes after him in the Jeep. Uh, she's able to get on because Bond is able to let the cargo back go or something. Uh, you know, flips the, the truck down or something. The, the plane down. I don't know what you call it, but she's able to get on there. Necro gets on there. They're going to try to get rid of the Bond. Bomb and Bond goes by there to do it, but they never shows up. Him and Bond get into a bit of a fight, which is that scene right there. Or I can't see it well. Sorry, him. He Bond, you know, tries to get a knife. Necro is able to foam. They get into the bags of this rope. Bond's able to cut the rope. They fall back. Uh, they open the cargo. And him and Bond and fall the window. They get a scene where they're just sort of hanging outside the window doors and stuff. It was a pretty entertaining scene. Uh, Bond kind of punches him a bit, you know, and the Bond's able to cut pieces of his lacing shoe off or whatever, and Necro's falls to his death, uh, and then Kyra almost wrecks him, but Bond's able to get back, and then they use the bomb, they get rid of it by, by helping the, the Afghanistan resistance by blowing up the bridge and killing the, uh, Soviets. Yeah, they plant the bomb on the bridge, and then Bond goes to confront Redeker and tells him that this is over, you're under arrest, and they'll stop him. Redeker won't give up, he puts up a fiber bond. Sorry, he puts up a fiber bond, he's like able to use a shield to fight Bond, he's like, pow, 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 pow. You know, he's able to, uh, he almost gets close to killing Bond, but Bond's able to use the whistle thing again, and then it blows up, you know, the stun gas comes up, and this wall thing falls on him. I don't know if, I think he dies, and then later Kuzco comes in try to, you know, pretend like he doesn't know anything, that Whitaker had him captured here, but then they tell him, you know, the jig is up, <laughs> and he's been caught, and he goes back to Moscow in prison, so, I don't know if they kill him. Sometime later, near the end of the movie, Kyra is, you know, leading the Jello band, she does very well, she thinks, she's wondering, you know, the, you know, she meets General Gulgolf a bit, he speaks to him, and then the, their Afghanistan friends show up, and like, where's Bond? And like, well, we had trouble getting through the they told her that they tell her that they had tr trouble getting by the airport, and I thought it was funny when him said, "I can't imagine why." And then at the end, she goes to her dressing room, is upset that Bond's not there. But then she here's the key, you know, she whistles back, and her and Bond probably make out of then. I'm guessing if this, and then the movie ends with the song, "If There Was a Man," you know that that's then the movie ends. So anyway, yeah, that's the Living Daylights. So 30 minutes in, I think I'm gonna stop here. So, yeah, and these are our villains of the movie, so, sorry, you probably can't see it well. But, now, what I think of it is, I think this is a decent movie. I don't blame them for going a darker direction, because, you know, there's one part where Bond is ruthlessly about to kill Bushkin, but he doesn't. So, it does show a bit of a darker side, which I like. Because Bond is, I like they show that he's ruthless killer side, which they've never done, they've done that before, like in Dr. No. When Bond, Sean Connery's Bond kills a uh, Professor Dent, you know, show that he could be a ruthless killer. Roger Moore, when he kicks that guy off the truck, you know, car off the cliff and, and live for Arizona. Excuse me, so, those are the parts where they show Will Bond will be a ruthless killer. They show it in another Bond movie, it's not only these. But, the problem is, you know, I don't blame them going to being a darker version, but I don't think the series needed to go that way. Yes, you could have made it more serious, but you could have had some good humor in there. You could have blended it in together. That's what I like about action movies. I don't mind humor. You know, that's... That's to me... that To me, that makes the movie entertaining and more memorable. memorable. But the thing I didn't like about the movie is... I didn't like the Afghan, Af Afghanistan scene. I thought that was kind of boring. Until the action started kicking in with Bonds on the cargo plane, the action starts. That was kind of boring. And I thought the film drags a little bit in some places. But it wasn't boring. And I... The main Bond girl was okay, Kara... 
she's pretty, but she was pretty forgettable. The villains were good, but I thought they were forgettable. I like Necros the most, but I thought him and Bond could have a better fight. And I thought the action in the film was decent. It wasn't nothing that great. I didn't think there was nothing too much to the action. Dalton, he is the Darker James Bond. The Darker James Bond. I like the, you know, that he shows the ruthlessness of the killer set of Bond. But he didn't have no charm or charisma. You need that for Bond. You gotta have charm, charisma. You do gotta have a sense of humor. You gotta have style as Bond. You know, you've gotta have that, you know. And, you know, Dalton, he just kind of looks pissed off all the time in this movie. Even when he's trying to be funny. Or trying to smile against smile. To me, it's like he was doing that. He's better than Roger Moore. Problem is, Roger Moore's too silly. The problem with Dalton, I think he's way too serious. You don't need that. No, Bond should have a sense of humor. Sean Connery had that. He would say something funny. Not every time. I'm not talking about over-the-top silly humor like in the Roger Moore Bond films. Roger Moore, at least, I thought he had charm and charisma. I don't think Dalton did. And, oh, he's the, oh, somebody's the, oh, he's the going, you know, by the Ian Fleming book. I don't care about that, people. I'm sorry. I want the James Bond guy in the movie. I don't want him in the book. I don't care about that. I don't care that they have to go by the book. That's my biggest issues with these two movies. I don't like that they go by the books. This movie, I still think it's a little overrated. I don't hate the film, guys. This isn't a rant. I don't hate this film. It's not awful. But to me, it's pretty forgettable. I'm sorry the action is decent. Dalton wasn't that great as Bond. In my opinion, and I'm going to get a couple of dislikes. I got a couple of dislikes on my other videos. Last time, I when I bring a bunch of more Bond films, I got a dislike. You know, if you're going to dislike my video, fuck you. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Okay? Don't watch my reviews. If you hate my videos, just turn the damn video off. This is my opinion, guys. Before I started these Bond reviews, I said this is all my opinion. And if you don't like it, then hit the road, Jack. Leave. You know, just turn the button off. Don't watch my videos. I don't care about people who dislike my videos. To me, they're just people that don't respect my opinion. They're just assholes to dislike because they're assholes. They're going to continue to do that. But I don't care because I'm going to keep giving my opinion whether people like it or not. You don't like my opinion, just turn off the video. But I think it's a decent movie. But I think it's overrated. That's just my opinion. I'm going to give the movie a rating 3 out of 5 stars. It's just... Overall, it's just... Kind of an okay movie. It's just okay I, at best at, at, to me. License to Kill, I think, is a way better movie, which I'm going to try to review that tomorrow. I'm going to stop here. I hope you guys enjoyed my review of The Living Daylights. I don't hate the film. Uh, you know, I do enjoy, you know, the thing, you know, the key chain he, the chi, the key chain he has that, you know, he can whistle. And some of the action was entertaining in it. But the movie didn't need to take itself too seriously, in my opinion. You could use some humor. Not over the top of the humor. Just like one-liners and stuff. You know. That's what I mean. Make it entertaining. Yes. Anyway, Living Daylight's decent. Okay movie. But it's not one of the worst Bond movies. But it's probably one of my least favorites. I'm sorry. It's just okay. But anyway, guys. Thank you for watching uh, my review of The Living Daylights. Uh, let me know what you think of this Bond movie. Respect my opinion. And I respect yours. So, uh, comment below. Let me know what you thought of it. What do you think of Timothy Dalton as James Bond? You know, what do you think of this movie? What's your opinion on it? Give your opinion on it. Don't you can disagree with me, but don't be an asshole. Don't be like, oh, it's by the books. It's by the books. It's, you know, he's the name from the book. I don't want to hear all that shit. I'm tired of that. You know, I have one person when I did my list of my favorite Bond actor. I have one person sort of attack me for my opinion. If you're gonna attack me, I might say something back. I will try to defend myself, but. Other than that, I just want to delete the comments, because if you're going to be an asshole, then get off my channel. Stop watching it. You don't like my video, you dislike, then just turn the video off. That's all you got to do. You're not forced to watch it. But anyway, guys, Living Daylights, decent movie. My rating for the film is 3 out of 5 stars. And next, I'm going to be reviewing the 16th James Bond movie, which I think is better than this film. And that is License to Kill. Yes. It's 1155. Okay, License to Kill. So I hope you guys enjoy my review of Living Daylights. Next is License to Kill, and I'll see you later, guys. Bye. Thanks for watching. Bye.